Hello and welcome to the weekly defense podcast, the show about defense procurement and military technology. This week brought to you in partnership with our sponsor, Bell. I'm your host, Noemi Di Stefano, joined today also by our air editor, Tim Martin. Hi, Tim. Hello. Senior naval reporter, Harry Lai. Hi. Hi, how are you? I'm good, thank you. And our military training editor, the one and only, Trevor Nash. Hello, Naomi. Hi there. Welcome back to the show, guys. How are you? Yeah, good. Yeah, good, thanks. I bet some of us uh, would have loved to be parking for the USA now, isn't it, Tim? Yeah, it'd be nice. Uh, Washington in the in the autumn or the fall, as the Americans say, is always uh, it's always quite nice. Um, w- one of my uh, favorite trips, actually, on the on the circuit as these things go. I have to ask though, what what do you expect the big news to be on the air front next week? Um, I mean, on the air front, you always get lots uh, in terms of uh, future vertical lift. So there'll be a, a media round table uh, with some of the, the American generals. Um, so it's it's always good to have them in one room and a rare opportunity to, to talk about the developments pretty much over the last year and what's uh, coming down down the line in terms of Farah and Flara. So you definitely expect news on on that front uh, and then um, the future tactical UAS as well. Okay, we will look at that next week, of course. But for the time being, our agenda for today, it includes weekly defence news highlights um, from the air and uh, naval domains, a look at the military training industry, a news roundup for from the Asia-Pacific with Gordon Arthur, our Asia-Pacific editor, and a word from our sponsor, bell. But uh, first things first, I look at some of the defence headlines from this week. Trevor, what have you been working on? Uh, one of my stories is, is looked at um, Germany sending two of its pilots to the Leonardo CAE International Flight Training School at uh, Lecce in Italy. Um, IFTS is planned to move to uh, Decimo Mano in Sardinia, and this is likely to be a, a hub for what NATO are calling NATO flight training in Europe a new programme for pilot training. Um, whether this is Germany just putting a toe in the water with these two guys is, is unclear because they s- currently send their fast jet pilots to Shepard Air Force Base in Texas to take part in the Euro-NATO Joint Jet Pilot Training Programme, NJET programme. Um, y- Europe has been discussing this fast jet training and other training really for, for a number of years now, but at least 25 so whether NFTE will come to fruition remains to be seen, but it's an interesting program that we're keeping an eye on here at Shepherd. Thank you. In the US, Crew Training International has been awarded another year on the MQ9 contract, which they call the Air Crew Training and Courseware Development CAT CD contract. The, the, the next year, which is the third year of a five-year program, they're going to get fifty-two million for this, um, and it's very interesting because when they launched the program. Um, it, it was a five-year program, as I say, and, and they predicted that it'd be worth around about a total of 241 million. Well, they've exceeded that already after three years and another two to go. So someone somewhere got their estimation significantly wrong on that one. And finally, um, back to Europe, the Dutch Navy, Netherlands Navy, has procured a new simulated submarine target from the French company RT Sis. Uh, this is called SEMA, and it's an autonomous, recoverable acoustic target that's already in service with a number of nations around the world, including France and India. Um, and, and the Dutch have procured seven targets. Four will go to the Royal Netherlands Navy, and three will go to Belgium. Um, so that's really the roundup of, uh, of my Newsweek so far. Wonderful. Thank you, Trevor. Um, Harry, what about you? Uh, probably the highlight this week uh, is a story uh, from... Uh, the U.S. Marine Corps operating two F-35B fighter jets from uh, the Japanese ship JS Izumo. So it's, it's a rare outing for me on the uh, on the on the air warfare pages. It's quite significant. It's the first time a, a fixed wing fighter in general has flown from a Japanese carrier since since World War Two. Okay, and before we move on, a couple of highlights from me from the land side, a piece from our contributor Tim Fish, who writes about the US Army recently awarding two full-rate production contracts for its MANPAC and leader radio tactical data radios. One of the contracts, the MANPAC, is a firm fixed price worth $226.5 million for L3 Harris and Collins 
aerospace, whereas the leader radio contract, again, is a firm fixed price and is worth $118 million for L3RS and Thales. And Tim also notes that the wider distribution of these radios is an essential part of the U.S. Army integrated tactical network infrastructure, which includes enhancements on cloud capabilities and SATCOM. And lastly, I just want to mention a story from Flavia Camargo Pereira, our uh, land reporter who unfortunately could not be with us today, but who reports on a first delivery to the German army of the Leopard 2 A7V tanks. Uh, this delivery marks a step forward for the German um, army contribution to the NATO a very high readiness joint task force, which uh, she notes the country is set to lead in 2023. And you can find more about the capability of the new upgraded Leopard 2 MBT by reading the full story on our website, shepherdmedia.com, and of course, more on the other copies there as well. Now, uh, since we are in Germany, uh, Tim, I just want to come over to you because you've been looking uh, for some answers this week from the German Bundeswehr on the uh, P-8 Poseidon platform plans uh, for the German Navy. Um, Just before we go into the news from this week, just give us a little bit of background on this uh, program. Uh, Yeah, so in in a nutshell, Germany as an interim solution uh, are looking to replace Lockheed Martin uh, P-3. Uh, see Orion's uh, MPAs. Uh, so the decision's already been taken to buy Boeing's uh, P-8A Poseidon. So an order's been placed for five aircraft. Um, and then in June, uh, the German uh, Parliament uh, Budgetary Committee put forward $1.43 billion for the procurement itself. And just at the end of September then, uh, Boeing announced that the U.S. Navy had formally awarded them uh, a production contract for the five aircraft aircraft that I've, that I mentioned. Uh, so basically that that's that's the the long and short of it. Um, but I suppose what's interesting and what I was kind of looking into is that in terms of the money being spent here it doesn't include any weapons. And so when the order was first approved by the US State Department in March, um yeah the, the aircraft were included uh, of course and then there was um a lot of uh, subsystems mentioned as well and within that within a package for $1.77 billion. But there was no weapons mentioned. So, you know, at, at this stage, you're talking nearly five, six months um, down the line, and still there's an unanswered question, really, about what weapons package um, Germany's going to go for. It, it Obviously, it is slightly obvious in that the U.S. Navy... Um, integrate the Mark 54 air launch light with torpedoes and the AGM 84D harpoons. Um, so there's limited options in terms of the weapon choices that Germany um, take on, unless, of course, they go spring a, a crazy surprise and look for something that's not off the shelf and do their own thing. But that would be... And a, a real shock, and because they'd have to go through qualification processes, and you know that that could take forever. And t- to be quite honest, there doesn't look like there's any obvious candidates in terms of uh, anti ship uh, missiles and so forth, other than other than you know the the obvious choices there that uh, the U.S. Navy have. So, so really, the question is, well, why are you holding out on not committing to a weapons package? So. Yeah, that was that was my question. Like, what is your take on this? What did they say? The the German spokesperson, the, the MOD spokesperson, said to me that there's some conditions tied to the decision on the, the weapons package. Now, you could read into that what you will, whether that's in terms of international um, export considerations uh, and whether the, the problem rests with Washington and trying to um, move this uh, forward. Um, we don't know because the U.S. State Department, of course, doesn't uh, you know doesn't comment on on these types of things, um, and you know there wasn't there's no additional information forthcoming from the German MOD. Yeah, re- remains to be seen really when you know when Germany will um, commit to this. Uh, but I think probably what what's interesting is 
certainly on the, the financial side, given that Germany publicly are saying that they're not only committed to Poseidon, but also the joint um, French MOS program. So that's the, the Maritime Airborne Weapons System. You know, that's two huge efforts. And MOS in particular is the next generation uh, MPA. So, you know, just the that'll be highly expensive. The bottom line on that is it'll be, it'll cost a lot of money. Um, so as it stands, they're, they're going to, to move forward with both. Um, now there is, there's been previous reports that, that France are considering pulling out of Moz based on the fact that Germany went ahead with the Poseidon procurement. Um, so, you know, this is where things get uh, slightly more interested and I'm sure there'll be a few more twists and turns. But going back to the Moz program, so is still, Germany is still in it, is still involved in it, is going ahead with it. Right. Uh, officially, yep, that's the line from the, the German MOD spokesperson. They're still committed, uh, and uh, yeah, they'll they'll still continue to uh, join forces with France. Um, now, I didn't speak to the French MOD, but I think it will be very, very interesting to see in the next few months because we're, they're moving, or they had been um, looking at um, studies, France and Germany, the tail end of, of last year on Moz. So, um, you know, whether there's been any movement since then just to progress things beyond studies, um, that'll be interesting to see or, or whether pretty much talks are, are on hold given that w w what's happened with, with Germany buying Poseidon. But just to kind of uh, talk a little bit more about uh, Poseidon uh, as well, just in terms of what it'll be doing, why it's important for Germany. Clearly, it's going to be primarily used for long-range uh, maritime uh, missions, anti-surface warfare uh, missions as well. And then just like the uh, the P3C, it'll be used from uh, Nordholz uh, naval base in, in Lower Saxony. Um, so, yeah, that kind of that rounds, rounds off the, the picture there with Poseidon. Okay, thank you, Tim. Does anyone have something to add to Trevor? Yeah. I guess the Germans have been presented with a bad situation because Mars is way into the future, you know, if, if it does take place. And, and those P3Cs up at Nordholz, I was up there a couple of years ago looking at them, the unserviceability rate was tremendously high and they could barely get one in the air out of the squadron. So I guess the Germans have been sort of forced into this in many ways. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, there, there, there was at one point uh, thinking that th they would upgrade the P3Cs, um, but that became too expensive. You know, I mean, it's it's quite extraordinary that that's the, the, the situation Germany left themselves in, that buying Poseidons was, was pretty much seen as the better option. And, it, and, it's, and, and it's clearly very expensive too. But you're absolutely right, going in terms of the, the current capability and the unserviceability of, of the P3Cs, they pretty much need to be replaced as soon as possible, and, and certainly the the in terms of the capability gap, the, the transition is twenty twenty five when they'll be out of service completely. So Boeing have already said that they'll make a first delivery in twenty twenty four. So so in terms of the overall picture, I guess yeah, Germany are are okay in terms of the capability, and there, there won't be any gaps. But beyond that, I mean, they also haven't really. Uh, help themselves because the ATL two from Dassault and France uh, was rejected to go ahead with Poseidon. So, not only have they they eliminated France from the the competition itself from the 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 new uh, MPA uh, program, but also on Moz as well. They're, they're they haven't really helped themselves because uh, pretty much France. Uh, don't really um, think, don't really uh, see much confidence in, in the fact that uh, the Poseidons have been bought. Well, just to clarify for, for me, so was Poseidon then the best choice uh, or it was just the cheapest choice as opposed to upgrading the P3C? Yeah, so, yeah, a couple of things on that. I guess what Germany might say, and, um, you know, I haven't heard from a, a spokesperson saying this, but clearly there's... Uh, interest and cooperation uh, that might be able that might be possible certainly when it comes to ISR 
uh, activities and a maritime surveillance over the Atlantic, interoperability opportunities with the UK who has who have uh, Poseidons and also um, Norway as well. So, you know, that probably facts factored into discussions as well. But, you know, P8 is, is very much a an in-demand uh, aircraft by virtue of uh, production rates as well. It's, it's certainly the, the more mature uh, platform compared to the ATL. Uh, to, I mean, Boeing are talking about, they have 135 Poseidons in service at the moment, uh, covering 350,000 flight hours. Um, you know, that's that's a fairly strong record. Look, it, it, is sen- it is sensible for Germany to have gone ahead with this. It's, it's more the the uncomfortable partnership that might that it might bring with with France um and yeah given uh what's happened with AUKUS as well um mm. yeah France can maybe maybe feel <laughs> aggrieved on on a, on a number of fronts things aren't quite working out uh, um as they might have hoped not a lot of luck there <laughs> um okay thank you thank you Tim um just let's move on to the naval domain. Harry, a story from you on the U.S. Navy reorganizing two existing program executive offices uh, or PEOs uh, to better support its submarine program acquisition. So tell us, what are these two uh, PEOs and what are the changes that have been made? Yes, yeah, so there, there's two reorganized existing uh, offices and then there's a, a third has been formed. Essentially, this is the U.S. Navy kind of rationalizing its submarine workforce to to cover everything from buying submarines to availability and the capabilities that they actually deliver. So there's one which is strategic submarines, so PEO strategic submarines. That replaces uh, PEO Columbia, which was the program office for the Columbia submarine. And that's the uh, nuclear armed submarines and the kind of the the future third leg of the U.S. nuclear triad. So that's that's one of them. Uh, the other is PEO attack submarines, which replaces PEO submarines. And that consolidates all of the USN's uh, kind of attack submarine development, acquisition and sustainment under one roof. So that's that's the Virginia class, uh, the kind of the few sea wolves that are left. And we'll also be in charge of developing SSNX, which will be the US Navy's next attack submarine. And and the final one is um, PEO under, Undersea Warfare Systems. And that's more about delivering combat capability and working on everything from kind of cybersecurity, resiliency, and that that, that works across all submarine platforms, so SSBNs and SSN. So all the current U.S. Navy submarine programs are going to be impacted by this reorganization of the POs? Yeah, yeah it literally the entire kind of USN submarine enterprise is being overhauled and kind of revamped a little bit. But the U.S. Navy are very keen to point out that um, all of the changes are aligned with, they say aligned with and will not impact the construction of the Columbia class. And Columbia is probably the U.S. Navy's top, uh, acquisition priority at the moment. Okay. And uh, I just wanted to ask you one last thing. A rear admiral you spoke to who's leading the PO strategic submarines said that um, this reorganizing is the most effective way to tackle the challenges that they are facing. Which which challenges uh, is he referring to? So, unfortunately, didn't actually get to speak to him directly. It's just a, just a quote floating around oh, there. But um, uh, the, the US Navy has got quite a few challenges when it comes to submarines. There's, there's a balance of priorities with the US Navy's budget. So its it's its budget has been relatively flat for the past 10 years. So a, as it expands, there's not really much room for bringing new things online or kind of ensuring you've got the people you need to crew them. The US Navy does have a goal of, I think, 66 submarines. So it's quite a, quite a substantial force that they're looking to develop and continue and uh, another problem is the actual uh, shipbuilding infrastructure itself u.s navy shipyards these are the public shipyards they're, they're kind of they're quite old most of them have got aging infrastructure and so there's a there's a major kind of ongoing project at the moment to ensure that u.s navy shipyards have dry docks that are actually big enough to fit the new submarines they are building in them that's another challenge and then and then capacity 
there's only so many shipbuilders that can build submarines and places you can build them. So there's quite a few different overarching problems, but it all kind of ties in together into kind of funding and capacity and then the ability to actually sustain sustain the fleet if you're trying to expand it. Okay, so it will serve the purpose of better planning overall, we, sh- we could say, yeah? Yeah, that seems to be kind of the the whole overall um, push for these new programme executive offices. Okay, thank you, Ari. There's going to be more conversation on submarines later with Gordon Arthur. We're talking Korean submarines there. Well, thank you, Ari. Um, Trevor, I it's it's your time now. You've been there quiet. <laughs> so I uh, we, we're not going to look at news from this week per se, but we're going to go back uh, to the SCI uh, for an insight on um, new training techniques and uh, the impact that they're having on operational readiness. And I know that you want to share with our listeners, a conversation that you had with the um, BAE Director of Defence Capability, who is also a former Royal Air Force pilot. So tell us more about this conversation. We need to put things into context. And, uh, and that context really is that more and more training is now being conducted in the virtual environment, in the, in the simulator. And, and that training covers individual training, crew training for the aircraft, and also collective training, where you network various simulators together um i I mentioned earlier on that we we've just had a big exercise in the united states in fact two big exercises in the united states where simulators were networked so that's that's a growing trend so that there seems to be an assumption at the moment within the air domain that the correct balance of training pilots is 50 percent live 50 percent in the simulator Where that figure came from, nobody quite knows, but people seem to accept it. Although a couple of years ago, this is quite interesting, that I was in Australia, um, Amberley, and I was speaking to the then OC of 33 Squadron uh, that fly the KC-30 MRTC, and he said that he would like to see 100% of training on the conversion course to the KC-30, 100% in the simulator. And he based his arguments on the fact that um, commercial airlines normally undertake what's called um, a ZFT, or for our American listeners, ZFT, zero flight time training, where they, they, they convert to type purely in the simulator. Now, that may sound strange to the military, but generally speaking, it's accepted in the commercial world. And a few years back, I was at a commercial aviation conference chatting to a training captain from British Airways who said to me, why on earth do we make our pilots go through elementary flight training, flying on a single-engine aeroplane, then a twin-engine aeroplane, piston engine aeroplane to get their commercial license when we could take them off the street and train them purely in the simulator. That, again, may sound crazy, but there is some merit to that argument. The military are slightly different because the average, (laughs) not the average, the average commercial airline does not pull G, does not have to fight the aeroplane. He's the pilot, he or she has got to fly the aeroplane. That's all, all they've got to do. So, you know, looking at this idea of collective training where we take various simulators and network them together, and this is really go- going. You know, the US, as ever, with simulation and training, was first to market with their project, um, which they now called um, Distributed Mission Operations. Uh, but before that, they were looking at uh, various things through DARPA, a program called SimNet. So they've been well ahead of everybody else. Um, we all know that virtual training has got a number of benefits, the key one being cost, cost because, yeah. you know, you plug the simulator in and switch your power on and you've got the simulator safety is another major impact if you're teaching people to fly high g maneuvers in a combat air environment you ideally want them to practice that in a in a benign simulator before they do it for real and the other benefit especially of this networking collective networking is to conduct um exercises where allies coalition forces can develop common operating procedures but 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 but, coming (laughs) Yeah. There are some unintended consequences. Um, and this is where my conversation with BA Systems comes to light. I had the opportunity of speaking to Sir Stuart Atta, who is the Director of Defence Capability at BA Systems Air. And Sir Stuart, um, the former three star Royal Air Force officer, uh, Harrier pilot, Eurofighter pilot, uh, he he knows his onions. And we were talking about distributed training and we were both on the same hymn sheet. And and Tilly said to me, 
we've got to worry a little bit about the transition. And what he meant by that was in peacetime, we can have 50%, 60%, 70%, 80%, 80% in the virtual environment. But what that means, in effect, is that the operational side, the support side for the air crew is denuded because politicians and uh, people that hold the purse strings say, well, wait a minute, we don't need all these maintenance technicians. We don't need all this live ordinance. We don't need a support structure, the um, chaos staff, force protection for the airfields. And they tend to forget about that. It's, it's never brought up. And so in peacetime, we have a force which is fundamentally denuded of the assets that it needs to go to war. But when we go to war, we suddenly swap from doing 50, 60, 70, 80% virtually to perhaps 90% live. There'll, there'll still be the use of simulation even in wartime for mission rehearsal. But we've got to make the, this massive flip. Well, we, you mentioned costs as one of the main advantages of, of uh, synthetic training. So if you were going to have 90% of the training in a live environment, then you will have cost issues. So how, how do you balance that out then? You're absolutely right. And as, as I said, there are some major benefits of doing things virtually. But there are also, as I say, these, these failings. So there is still going to have to be a... Um, analysis of the, the balance required. Primarily, there still needs to be a lot of virtual training, but politicians, policymakers, senior Air Force officers need to realise that they cannot uh, mount operations without the correct equipment. So perhaps one of the things that we need to look at when everybody said about virtual training, yes, it's a massive cost saver, maybe we need to bite the bullet and say, yeah, it is a cost saver, but maybe some of those costs that we're saving are a false, it's a false economy because we still need to maintain that, you know, logistic footprint. I mean, I'll give you a quote from Sir Stuart. He, he said to me, you then have to address a supply chain that is now has to support 100% live operations. If you're driving people down the synthetic route, you need to have a clear idea of your operational and logistic models. And then this spins back into the training model. So he's, he's arguing basically that training is, is so linked into the, um, it, it, in this case, as he's saying, the um, organizational and logistic models. But people tend to forget i I was reading the story and I saw that he was also emphasizing emphasizing the fact that uh, another uh, important thing is that there needs to be greater collaboration between uh training providers so i I just wanted to ask do you think that greater collaboration in between these empty uh giants could be one of the 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 routes to pursue to achieve that balance in between live training and virtual training yeah i mean I i hate to um, plough the same furrow that I've been ploughing for many years now. I firmly believe that the majority of the expertise in the training uh, environment belongs with industry because industry, Lockheed Martin being a classic example, Lockheed Martin operate flight training, provide flight training in the UK, in Australia, in Singapore, in the USA. They can glean information, knowledge from all of those uh, countries, their customers. And so if another customer needs a flight training service provided, that company, as an example, there are many companies like it, have a massive wealth of international experience. So, so, so in, in industry, working closely with the military is the way we should be moving forward. In, in the UK, um, 10 years ago, we were talking about the whole force, which included active service personnel, reserve personnel, and industry. We seem to have forgotten about the whole force concept now. Um, which is a pity. Thank you, Trevor. Does anyone else want to add anything on this? Any final thoughts from anyone? <laughs> Silence. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. For our listeners, thank you as well for joining us today. And a gentle reminder that uh, for more coverage, previous episodes of the podcast, video content and more, you can visit our website, shepherdmedia.com. Time now for a short break. Coming up next, I'm joined by Gordon Arthur for the monthly news roundup from the Asia Pacific. And if you want to know all about new Chinese equipment and more, then stay with us.
This episode of the Weekly Defence Podcast is brought to you in partnership with Bell. To learn more about the latest developments of the Bell V280 Valor and the generational advances it is bringing to the US Army, you can visit bell.co forward slash Team Valor. Bell has the right team and the right technology right now. The US Army needs a flight-proven weapon system with the speed, range and versatility to maneuver in increasingly complex multi-domain operations. That solution is the Bell V280 Valor. Tomorrow's national security threats cannot be met unless we modernize the Army's current aviation fleet. Bell has assembled the right team, Team Valor, and the right technology, the Bell V280, to meet this critical need. Bell is redefining tomorrow's battlefield with operator-driven engineering solutions and demonstrated performance, reducing risk and improving life cycle maintenance costs. Able to deliver on the US Army's modernization requirements, Team Valor and the V280 is ready now. Learn more about the V280's revolutionary performance by visiting bell.co forward slash FVL. Welcome back to the second segment of the podcast. This is the Asia-Pacific News Roundup, where we look back at what made the headlines in defense in the region over the past month. I'm Noemi De Stefano, and I'm joined by, of course, our Asia-Pacific editor, Gordon Arthur. Gordon, hi. Welcome back to the podcast. How are you? Hi, Noemi. It's nice to be talking to you, to someone different rather than Ben. <laughs> Yeah, I'm really excited to to be recording this segment with you. We just needed to wait for Ben to go on holiday to do this. <laughs> uh, no, I'm I'm really excited. Really, um, uh, I I love your coverage and I I love the defense news from that part of the world. Really, I think the first time that I heard you on the podcast it was when I listened to one episode to do my interview at Shepard and you were covering some uh, first landing helicopter dock arriving in China and the first boxer to be delivered in Australia. Okay. And I was a like, long time ago. <laughs> yeah, that's that's 2019, I think. Uh, and I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. I want to speak to this guy one day. So... <laughs> <laughs> Here we are. Here we are. <laughs> um, so we have a bit uh, to unpack today. And uh, of course, I want to start from China, which uh, continues to show uh, an arsenal of new capabilities all the time. And it was the case at the 13th China International Aviation and Aerospace Expo, uh, which took place, I think, at the end of September in Zhuhai in right. South China. Yes, so a lot of capabilities, uh, air capabilities, air defense systems, land systems. Let's start from from uh, the air and look at UAV and aircraft designs that were showcased. So what did we see there? Sure. So, yeah, the Zhuhai Air Show, it's, it's, it's a huge event, um, perhaps one of, if not the uh, largest um, defense shows in the world. And it's a good chance to, to see uh, Chinese industry, Chinese military equipment uh, for what is normally a very opaque um, country. And the Zhuhai Air Show had actually been delayed by nearly a year. It was supposed to be held end of last year, uh, but of course COVID-19 put paid to that. Uh, but there are there a number of interesting things and I'll, I'll, I'll do a quick uh, rundown for you, Noemi. Um, and then perhaps yeah, sure. if there's a couple that you want to, to focus on, uh, we can sort of hone in on them. Uh, but for me, one of the significant ones was the appearance of a, a J-16D fighter, which is actually an, an electronic warfare um, aircraft. Uh, it's the first time a J-16 has actually appeared at the, the Zhuhai Air Show. Um, and the J-16 is actually based on a, a Russian Sukhoi-30 uh, airframe. Um, we presume uh, that the J-16D is now in PLA Air Force Service uh, because the aircraft had a construction number 0109, which suggests it's the ninth aircraft in the first production batch. Um, we could say that the J-16 is pretty much the equivalent of the US Navy um, Growler, uh, the EA-18G, so used for electronic warfare. Um, so that was a that was quite a, a, revolu a revel revelation um, as well as a revolution, perhaps. <laughs> And moving on to UAVs, um, that's always 
a very interesting field as well. So we had uh, different designs, uh, such as the the CH6, uh, which is a um, an unmanned combat air vehicle shown for the first time. Uh, the PLA Air Force showed off the W7, uh, sorry, the WZ7 Soaring Dragon, which is a high altitude, long endurance UAV. I guess again we could say it's the equivalent of the um, Global Hawk used by the Americans. Another interesting mm-hmm. one was the the WZ8 High Speed Reconnaissance UAV. Um, this actually appeared at the 2019 parade in in Beijing, and I I did see it there. Um, So this is a a UAV, a very um, futuristic looking one. It's probably carried by an H6N bomber um, and can be released in in midair. And one other one that's worth mentioning too was the FH-97. This was a a conceptual UAV, and probably along the lines of a a loyal uh, wingman-type aircraft, um, such as um, the US and Australia are developing. Yeah. We will talk about the FH-97 in a minute. I just wanted to ask you about the CH-6, because I know we've got a little bit of an insight on this one, as uh, uh, you spoke to the chief designer at the China Academy of Aerospace Aerodynamics, and he gave you uh, some background on on this variant. So what did he say exactly? Um, well, he was talking to, to media um, at the show. And oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I, I wasn't yeah. able to be there because of uh, COVID restrictions. Um, plus, I don't want to be kidnapped by the, the Chinese, as happens to Canadians and, and others. So, um, <laughs> yeah, the CH6, um, it was a, a mock-up um, that was shown. It's a new, new design. Um, it's a medium altitude, long endurance UAV designed to, to carry weapons. Um, the, the configuration is a bit different to anything that the company um, has produced before. And this is the China Aerospace Science and Technology Corporation, or CASC. And uh, work on the CH6 started uh, mid-2019. And we're expecting the first flight um, October next year. So perhaps I can just quote um, what the chief designer said. Yeah, please. Um, He described it as follows. The CH-6 is capable of performing a wide range of tasks, including high altitude reconnaissance and airstrike, anti-submarine and sea patrol operations, long range early warning and close in firepower support. In future combat scenarios, the drone can engage in groups, oh, sorry, can engage in action in groups and can also cooperate with piloted aircraft or other unmanned hardware to conduct various types of operations. Um, So the aircraft, 20 and a half meter wingspan, uh, top speed of 800 kilometers an hour, available in a reconnaissance version, which is unarmed, or an armed version. Um, different ranges and endurances for, for each one. Obviously, the the armed UCAV version, uh, because it's carrying a lot of payload, um, it can't fly as far or as long. Okay. And um, is there uh, anything uh, equivalent, unequivalent platform uh, in a Western country uh, at all? Yeah, I'd, 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 I'd say it's, it's the equivalent of the American... Um, Reaper or uh, previously the the Predator. So similar uh, capabilities. Um, CH-6 is obviously a development. I mean, we have the the CH-3, CH-4, CH-5. Um, This is a a more top-end unmanned air vehicle from from this particular company in China. So every model that they are introducing becomes more capable um, and and an improvement on the, the, the previous one. Okay. And in terms of market for this platform, is this aimed on an export market or is China looking at uh, producing and manufacturing this capability for uh, its own air force? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, so far, the Chinese military has tended to go for the, the Wing Long um, series of, of UAVs, which are equivalent to the, the, the CH-4. So quite possibly that the PLA might be interested if it offers sort of new capabilities and and better performance than what it already has. Um, But to date, yeah, the the CH series um, from from China is predominantly been export markets. And and quite interestingly, 
um, someone at the show actually quoted that the, the CH4 um, has been sold to, to more than 10 countries to date and has completed more than 20,000 flight hours and performed more than 800 missile strikes. So they're, they're being used uh, quite heavily, it seems. Okay. Um, just moving to the other platform that we mentioned, uh, that you mentioned earlier, the F-897 UAV. So we said it looks like the uh, Kratos Valkyrie, Valkyrie uh, XQ-58A, which is um, the platform that has been designed for the United States Air Force low-cost attributable strike demonstrator program. Mm -hmm. So um, in your story, you say is, this looks like a copy of the Valkyrie, um, the Chinese one. Uh, so do we know how long it has been in the making? Uh, I, I would like to be able to answer that question. Uh, if only we did know. <laughs> we don't know. Um, no, I, I'd say it's still conceptual. It's still developmental. Um, again, this is from, from CASC or CASC. Um, it's yeah. part of a, a series Uh, the Fei Hong series of, of UAVs. So again, yeah, it looks like the American XQ-58A Valkyrie, as you said. But then again, a lot of these loyal wingman type uh, UAVs, they all tend to look quite similar in the end. Um, when, when the project actually started, I'm not sure. Um, it seems that it's going to be intended to be powered by two jet engines. Um, the size of the mock-up looks similar um, to the Valkyrie. Um, whether it's des being designed for the, the PLA Air Force or for export markets is not clear yet. So I guess we, we will find out. But I, I think if you look at um, countries like the US, the UK, Australia, they're all seriously, seriously considering and developing uh, these loyal wingman type um, aircraft. So I can absolutely bet um, that China is, is doing the same. So this, this could be one effort. Um, there may be other sort of more secret um, efforts that are going on by the military as well. Um, lots of speculation involved. <laughs> well, we'll find out. You'll find out, I'm sure. Eventually, yes. Yeah. Eventually. Uh, let's look at some of the uh, land uh, Cowabadies on display. There is a huge number. I was reading your story and I was lost. <laughs> there is so much, so much there on display. Where do you want to start? Yeah, I mean, the that's why I said it's one of the, the largest and certainly for me one of the most interesting um, shows um, around uh, just by the, the sheer innovation and the, the sheer quantity of, of stuff that China um, is, is putting out there. So maybe if, if we were to highlight just a couple of, of things, uh, one of them I would um, mention is uh, a new armoured personnel carrier uh, or perhaps better described as an infantry fighting vehicle Um, from Narinko, and uh, it's called the, the VN-22. So this is a six-wheeled uh, vehicle. Um, the PLA has a number of, of six-wheeled APCs in service, the, the, the Type 92 family. Um, so whether this is designed as a, a replacement for that, I, I don't know yet, um, but certainly more capable. And significantly, um, it has an unmanned turret. Um, in this case, it had a, a UW-5 unmanned turret with a 30 millimeter cannon and pop-up um, anti-tank missile launcher. Um, so this was being shown for the, the first time uh, from Narinko. And perhaps one of the other ones I could mention is, is radar. Are you interested in radars, Noemi? Yes. I like radars <laughs> just because I I don't know much about them. So yeah, well, yeah, the Chinese ones we don't know an awful lot about them either. Uh, certainly not their performance uh, because the the closely kept secrets. But every every time at Zhuhai Air Show they um, they show a number of different radars, and the main manufacturer in China is called the the China Electronics Technology Group Corporation or CETC. And um, unsurprisingly, they had uh, quite a number of, of different radars there. And just to pick out one of them, it was the, the YLC-8E. Um, Now, this particular radar, um, it was mounted on a, an 8x8 uh, truck chassis. Um, the radar is, is raised and, and unfurled. Um, they, they say it's about the size of two badminton courts, if you can imagine that. 
significant thing about this. Oh my God. It's, a, it's an anti-stealth air defense radar. Uh, it works on the, the UHF uh, frequencies. So China would claim um, it's, it's designed to uh, detect and, and track stealth targets, um, especially things like F-35s probably coming from Japan or the US and uh, those kind of places. So it's, it's actual performance, uh, difficult to, um, to assess, um, but apparently it, it, it can use different wavelengths um, in order to, to track these stealthy targets. Yeah, when I read about this, I was looking for images of it as well. And I had more or less the same reaction that I had when I uh, saw the uh, colossal road uh, mobile ballistic intercontinental <laughs> ballistic missile last year in the North Korean parade. I was like, whoa, what is this? So um, is this something that we have seen before anywhere? Uh, and if not, how how then is it different and could could it be uh, the start of a new trend of radars? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's horses for courses, isn't it? You have different radars for, for different purposes. Uh, this one specifically seems to have been designed to um, target stealthy targets. Uh, and I should mention that this is actually just one of a, a family um, of radars. So um, CETC also showed others, uh, the SLC, which works in the L band. Uh, they had the SLC-12, which works in the S band. And they also had the YLC-12, which works in the C-band. C so uh, different radars for different purposes um, to track different targets. Um, certainly, uh, we, we can agree that Chinese technology is improving. Um, for example, um, these are, are now using gallium nitride um, technology. Yeah, uh, again, it, it's just difficult to, to separate claims and, and, and facts from fiction uh, when it comes to claims about um, Chinese radar performances. Yeah, it's, it's just Lingdong. Lingdong. Yeah, they they called it the the Lingdong family. So um, a, they can network. Uh, they can share information together. Okay. Yeah, we can all ag agree on the fact that Chinese technology is improving. Uh, they had me there with the microwave weapons that they used in the Sino-Indian mm. poster. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah la lasers, microwaves, uh, they're, they're doing quantum uh, research, yeah. So, yeah, all sorts of things they're into. Yeah, but just to wrap up on, on China then, uh, so this specific reader, who who... Who might be interested in in buying this is uh, it, again? Is absolutely, the PLA um, Air Force. So uh, that that would be the the number one um, customer. Yeah. Okay. Let's move to another country in of China for today. Let's go to Indonesia, which has ordered uh, five new uh, Hercules uh, for its air force. So, tell us more about this order. What will it bring to the Indonesian air force? Yeah, I mean, this this sort of came as a little bit of a surprise because we didn't really know that Indonesia had ordered um, the C-130J um, Hercules aircraft until we, we saw a, a photo um, of the Indonesian Air Force's chief of staff sitting in a, uh, sitting or standing next to a, a C-130 cockpit section um, at the Lockheed Martin factory in, in the USA. Um, so... That was um, 7th of September, that photo was appeared. Um, and then since then, we've discovered that, yes, uh, Indonesia has ordered five uh, Hercules aircraft. Um, so that will be a, an important boost um, for the uh, Indonesian Air Force. And uh, in your study, you mentioned that uh, there could be an issue for this specific order when it comes to uh, ordering uh, spare parts for Indonesia because there have been in the past embargoes uh, from the US uh, for the US to export parts in Indonesia. So uh, is there a backup plan for Indonesia if they can't get spare parts? Yeah, the, 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 the reason that they've had problems in the past, uh, and this includes Hercules and F-16s, um, related to embargoes that the, the USA um, imposed um, because of the, the East Timor, um, Indonesia's actions against East Timor. Um, so that was the uh, a while ago now. Um, but interestingly, yeah, I mean, the, the Air Force chief, when, uh, when he was in the USA, he, he expressed a hope um, that there would be a reliable source of spare parts for these new Hercules. So, 
perhaps it's something in the back of the minds of of the Indonesians that um, one day again they they might uh, face a, a similar embargo. Of course, that would depend upon uh, different countries' actions, but um, that's something of concern. I, I think for me, one interesting aspect to this story is Indonesia has often talked about the fact that it wants to buy the A400M from Airbus. The fact that it's gone ahead and is buying five Hercules, um, and we should also note that it's also obtained a number of secondhand um, Hercules from Australia. Um, if it's sort of putting all its eggs into the Hercules basket, uh, does that suggest that the A400 deal is is dead in the water? Um, so no one has said anything. Um, Indonesia talks big. Um, it wants this, it wants that. Um, so whether it's actually put paid to Airbus's hopes, uh, we're not quite sure yet, but one to watch. Okay, thank you for that insight on Indonesia, Gordon. We have still three more countries to cover and we're running out of time. Oh, so let's be I quick. want to... <laughs> let's I no, I want to I want to move to another country with uh which also like uh, you said about Indonesia says that wants to buy this and that <laughs> and uh, that's India. <laughs> uh a new deal for the country and uh also not uh, so bad of a deal for the European multinational Airbus, which uh, has brought home another deal for C295 mm. platforms for India. So tell us about that. What is, first of all, the background to the Indian procurement of C295? Yes, this is a nice segue from the A400 in Indonesia through to the C295W in India. India has talked for a long time about the need to procure new medium lift transport aircraft. Um, it has more than 50 um, HS-748 Avros. Uh, these are really old aircraft, um, so it's desperately in need of uh, replacing those. So uh, we have uh, approval um, and a contract um, from, from India uh, for 56 of these C-295 aircraft. Uh, this is a really important deal for Airbus because so often it's got really close to contracts, whether it's aircraft or helicopters. And then Indian red tape and and uh, ineptitude basically has, has hindered or cancelled um, a lot of these deals. So the fact that this one is proceeding, um, really, really important. The other important thing is that these are, most of these are going to be built in India. Yeah, two and a half billion dollar deal approximately. So the first 16 will be built in Spain and the remainder will be built in India. So significant boost to uh, Indian industry there. At a, at a local manufacturing level, how, how many uh, Indian companies are involved in uh, in the making of the C295? Difficult to know yet. Um, we should mention the, the main contractor will be the Tata Group. So this will be the, yeah. the company that's uh, building them in conjunction with Airbus. And significantly, this is the first time a, a private Leone company uh, will be building aircraft for the Indian Air Force. Uh, previously, we, it was always um, Hindustan Aeronautics Limited that would build um, aircraft. So that's, that's a big step up for, for India. Um, good news for, for the Tata Group and particularly good news for the Indian Air Force, which is desperate to get more modern transport aircraft. Uh, how many companies will be involved? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I guess the details will begin to emerge, but certainly big opportunities for small, micro, small, medium um, enterprises in India. What were you expecting uh, India to make this step? Um, yeah, that, I mean... This, this has been an on-again, off-again uh, deal for quite some time. So India's always um, stipulated it wanted um, local production. So uh, it was just, just a matter of um, hammering out the details and stumping up with the money. <laughs> okay, let's uh, move further east again where uh, and delve into the realm of submarines. And obviously our listeners so could anticipate that we're going to go into the AUKUS program mm -hmm. eventually, very shortly. Uh, so let's talk about uh, uh, South Korean uh, submarines because South Korea is making progress on its uh, submarine program. So give us, the, give us an update uh, on that. Yeah, this is really important because um, it was the first time for a South Korean submarine um, to successfully fire a submarine-launched ballistic missile. Um, this, this happened early September. 
I think the previous month um, it had fired a missile from a, an, an underwater platform, but this was actually from a, a submarine. Um, and this is the first uh, KSS-3 um, submarine. And it's also the first non-nuclear power in the world uh, to actually fire a, a submarine launched ballistic missile. And as you can guess, the, the main reason is um, because of the, the threat of South Korea's neighbor to the north. Um, South Korea is very concerned about its belligerence. Uh, North Korea is, is firing off ballistic missiles and cruise missiles left, right and center. Um, and having this ability to fire from a, a submarine, um, it gives South Korean military a, a, a more uh, ability to, to, to make surprise attacks um, and, and also deterrence against North Korea. How, uh, what, what further tests are, are expected to take place before uh, South Korea could, can deploy the platform? Yeah, I'm not sure how many more tests it will do. Um, the the submarine has actually it's it's been commissioned uh, into the the ROC Navy, uh, but it won't be until next year that the submarine becomes fully operational. Uh, perhaps we will see more tests uh, before then. Uh, I'm not sure, um, but the fact that this one was successful uh, was important. So, yeah, the the Hyunmu uh, people are calling it the four dash four. Uh, ballistic missile, I believe to have a, a range of about 500 kilometers um, and carrying a, a conventional warhead. So, yeah, a, a, a first for the South Korean Navy um, and an important boost to its capability. And, and just finally, in this one, in your story, you mentioned uh, South Korean ambition for uh, nuclear powered submarines. I understand this ambition has been uh, going on for a few years now. Uh, my first question to you is uh, can, can South Korea even afford to get a nuclear, nuclearly powered submarine? Yeah, I, I think so. I, I mean, it's, it's a very controversial issue in South Korea, but certainly I believe that the ROC Navy is interested in it because um, North Korea is, is seeking um, the ability to, to launch nuclear missiles um, from submarines. And it believes that the, a nuclear submarine would be the, the best way of, of countering um, this threat. There would be a lot of regulatory um, and also public opinion obstacles to, to overcome along the way. Um, but the USA, for example, has, has certainly um, reduced its restrictions um, on South Korea and allowing it to develop different kinds of missiles and, and different military technologies. Um, so we would say it's, it's a long-held ambition um, of, of South Korea, um, just yeah. a matter of how long it could take to, to develop. Um, and I'm sure it would need technical assistance from, from somewhere like America. Okay. Uh, another one who needs the help from uh, the US is, of course, Australia. So now we, we have covered this. Uh, our listeners who have listened to previous episodes, they, they've heard us covering the August Pact. But of course, Gordon, I need to ask you, what do you think about this? So my, my only question is going to be, what do you think about this? Were you expecting this to happen at all? Um, about the nuclear submarines for Australia. Uh, no, take them by surprise. Yes. Um, were we surprised that the attack class with the naval group was running into trouble? No. Uh, we've been talking about this for, for a number of years. Um, cost blowouts, uh, time scheduled delays, um, friction between the Australians and, and naval groups. So that's, that's old news. Um, I don't know. The more I look into this, the more I see it is actually very disjointed. Um, and it, it seems the, the left hand and the right hand had no idea what each was doing. Because apparently the, the very same day that the AUKUS announcement was made and the nuclear submarine announcement was made, um, a naval group, naval group had received a, a letter from the Department of Defense um, stating that it uh, proposals for the next phase of the attack class had been um, accepted. So it seems that some officials were, were steaming full ahead with the attack class, um, while others were um, organizing or had plans to, to cancel it and, and go for, for nuclear power. So very chaotic. Um, and the fact that it will now take a year and a half 
for the Australians, the Americans and the Brits to figure out what to do next. Um, I think that's sort of an indication um, that it was it was quite short notice. Um, it hasn't been completely thought through um, and there's a lot of decisions to be made um, in how to get these submarines into Australian Australian hands. So, yes, surprised um, they went nuclear. Uh, not surprised um, that they've axed the, the French deal. Um, was it a good idea? Probably. Would it have been a better deal if they'd gone this way straight from the start? Um, of course, that would have been ideal uh, because they wouldn't have the, the angry French to deal with um, along the way. Okay. I am going to leave it there, really, because uh, I'm sure that uh, the listeners are interested in your comments rather than mine. So thank you very much, Gordon, for these insights on all these uh, countries in the Asia-Pacific region. And we will chat next month again. Excellent. Pleasure to talk to you, Noemi. Thank you. Thanks. Artificial intelligence is rapidly changing the world in which we live. Evidence of artificial intelligence is all around us and will have profound implications on everyday life in the decades to come. In the military world, artificial intelligence technologies are having a similarly massive effect and are beginning to change the face of modern warfare. Artificial intelligence and machine learning applications promise to enhance productivity, reduce user workload, and operate more quickly than humans. But this doesn't come without its challenges. How easy is it for an adversary to fool artificial intelligence systems? How well do AI systems cope with a chaotic and ever-changing conflict? And how will the human in the loop oversee AI systems on a battlefield swarming with autonomous assets? The Artificial Intelligence on the Battlefield podcast dives into these issues and more. How will artificial intelligence reshape the future of warfare? Created by Shepard Studio, in partnership with our sponsor Sistel, the Artificial Intelligence on the Battlefield podcast on shepherdmedia.com forward slash news or wherever you get your podcasts. So welcome to the part of the show that we like to call Industry Voice. This week we're sponsored by Bell. Um, I'm joined by Jay Blank, who is the Senior Manager of Government Affairs at Bell. Uh, first of all, Jay, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks. Thanks for having me, Tony. Glad to be here. So, Jay, we're, we're here to discuss the U.S. Army's Future Vertical Lift program. And just to recap for listeners, um, Bell, of course, is a competitor for the Army's FARA and FLARA programs with the Bell 360 Invictus and the V280 Valor, respectively. Obviously, a lot of attention is paid to those platforms and the development of those platforms. But, you know, I guess another key aspect to any successful program is keeping platforms, keeping aircraft affordable. So just to kick off, really, I guess the question is, how is the US Army and Bell approaching the future vertical lift program in terms of those ever-present budget concerns? So I think the Army and, and DOD more widely is now looking at the total life cycle costs on weapons platforms. So what Bell has done is, is looked at the two major parts of, of the equation that make up life cycle costs. So there's the acquisition, you know, um, and development of weapon systems for, for procurement. Uh, so, you know, quite simply what you're going to pay to get a weapon systems brought in, uh, into the, into service. And then there's the O and S costs. Um, for that weapon system once it, it's on the flight line or deployed with a unit. So those are the two big elements uh, of, of the life cycle cost. And Bell's looking at both of those. Uh, generally speaking, in the past, it's all been about, you know, producing a platform for a certain uh, price point when, that meets requirements. And then on the ONS side, once that platform showed up up in the field, it was up to the maintainers and the service to figure out what the best way was to maintain that platform, often by discovery. And sometimes some of the discoveries weren't great. So Bell's looking at both sides, both developing uh, the best, uh, most affordable solution they can on, on the front end. And then once that goes into possession of the Army uh, designing in attributes into the aircraft that'll help on the back end as well. Excellent. And I guess just to 
perhaps further set the scene. We, we've heard a lot about sort of the fact that any future op operations will be in a kind of multi-domain operational environment. How does that translate, I guess, to an Army aviation context? Um, how different will Army aviation fly and maintain their aircraft and that sort of expected multi-domain operational environment, I guess, compared to how things work now? So I guess a couple of points, you know, when you look at multi-domain operations, you're talking about operations in a distributed environment to, to, for, from a survivability uh, perspective, that's going to be required. And it just makes sense that if you're operating those platforms in that type of environment, one, uh, that leaves you less options for support. So you need aircraft that are just inherently dependable and reliable and will operate away from a home you know, home base, so to speak, or forward operating base, they're, they're able to move out away from that type of support and survive uh, and continue to operate with minimal amount of maintenance. So, you know, on the operational side of the house, the aircraft's got to be able to do that. And then on the sustainment side of the house, whatever it takes to support that aircraft has to have that same uh, agility. Uh, so I call it strategic and tactical uh, sustainment agility, the ability to do operations and maintenance well forward uh, with a, a scheduled maintenance that supports operations without that large logistical uh, trail. So, yes, I mean, that's that's a really good good point, Jay. Um, I, 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 you know, I guess the other question is, how do you generate that lean sustainment force while operating alongside the existing fleet? Presumably the existing fleet will still require that larger sustainment footprint. Um, so I guess what's what's the upside there? So so to start with, you know, what we won't be doing is large presence of contractors, you know, what we traditionally call blue suit maintenance. So a whole lot of people somewhere supporting an aircraft. That won't be present. It can't be present, both from a, a cost a standpoint and from a lean sustainment trail standpoint. So some of the things we would do is bring uh, uh, things like MSG3, which is our approach to scheduled maintenance with, with future vertical lift, which allows us to be real smart about when we're pulling maintenance. We want to get rid of the maintenance that's unnecessary. Um, we know that that's costly. We know that it drives uh, availability problems. We want to be as lean as we can while maintaining a safe aircraft. And, and the upside to all of this is the improvements that we're making with future vertical lift will work well within the existing Army sustainment program. And what I mean by that is the, the existing aircraft will have their demands. We will certainly not exceed those demands. Our, our demands we expect will be significantly less, but we will integrate into those existing systems. So in terms of reporting, uh, in terms of how the aircraft are, are managed, we can work well within the existing Army sustainment systems. Uh, we'll just be able to do it in an enhanced fashion. Excellent. And as, as we said, I guess, at the top end, the U.S. Army is obviously keeping a close eye on budgets, you know, the, the performance of future vertical lift programs. You, you, you know, you gave some great, great examples there, but could you provide any more examples about Bell's, how Bell's approach will ensure that, you know, the programs we mentioned are successful? So, you know, we talked earlier about whether you're on the procurement, uh, procurement side of the equation or on the uh, operational and sustainment side of the equation. So Bell, again, has looked at both of those. One of the key things we're doing uh, from the development of the uh, perspective is burning down risk on the program overall. So we started with a digital design uh, and using model-based systems engineering We've been able to look at, the, at a smart way to put the aircraft together, take advantage of that digital design so we can exercise in a digital environment what the aircraft's going to be doing, learn a lot of lessons up front. The other thing we did is we, we had a very uh, extensive flight testing. So we flew our aircraft over 214 hours and really exercised that aircraft in an actual flying environment. So we know that it works. Um, and then some of the other things we'll be bringing to bear uh, is one is MOSA, which is, you know, in, in short is the ability to upgrade uh, mission systems on the aircraft 
pretty much at the speed of innovation. So we'll be able to bring those systems on much faster because we'll have an open system approach to the aircraft. And then we're also investing in manufacturing technology. So we've, we have a uh, manufacturing technology uh, center now where we're proving out the manufacturing of our components, those processes, those materials, those techniques, so that when we go to actual production, it won't be new to us. We will have already gone through and taken advantage of those innovations and tested them out ahead of time. Excellent, Jay. I mean, that, that approach sounds like it should work out, but I guess I'm wondering, you know, where, where the challenge lies, you know, what sort of things are concerning you and your team as you take things forward? So, you know, one of the things that I think that's going to be important and the Army is, is working hard on this and really all of DOD is, and that's the idea of connecting um, the aircraft with the larger enterprise. So there's a lot of opportunity there, uh, both in terms of when you have a, a health-aware aircraft, which our aircraft will be, we have systems on board that allow the aircraft to inform others on its own health. Connecting that back to uh, the Army for both uh, from a logistics standpoint, from a fleet management standpoint, uh, and then even uh, the ability to connect various sensors and move information around. Those, those will be challenges for the Army writ large, but it's a, it's a good challenge to have. It just means we're going to have the data. The, the challenges in, in, for the Army will be connecting everything, you know, as we've discussed in joint. Uh, all domain uh, command and control, the ability to connect th these nodes effectively out there uh, so that we can gain the full benefit of what, what the aircraft brings uh, to the fight. Excellent. That's I mean, it's really good to hear. Obviously, we we, we, we track the developments of the, both the Bell 360 Invictus and the, the V280 Valor as the, those platforms are, you know, developed going into, into flight tests and everything else. But really good to hear how both the U.S. Army and Bell are approaching those programs to ensure that, that ultimately they will be affordable um, and sustainable in, in, through the, the long term. Jay, we're out of time, but yeah, I just want to say thanks very much for joining us on the podcast. Hey, thank you very much, Tony. Appreciate the opportunity. This episode of the Weekly Defence Podcast was brought to you in partnership with our sponsor, Bell. As always, a big thanks to everyone who took the time of being with us today. And for our listeners, if you enjoyed the show, make sure you like and subscribe, leave a review on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts from. Until next week, thanks for listening.